Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part four, The Genius of Freemasonry from Mystic Masonry by J.D. Buck. Chapter two, The Genius of Freemasonry. The whole world is but one republic of which each nation is a family and every individual a child. Masonry, not in any wise derogating from the differing duties which the diversity of states requires, hence to create a new people, which composed of men of many nations and tongues, shall all be bound together by the bonds of science, morality, and virtue. Pikes, Morals, and Dogma, page 220. In fine, the real object of this association, Freemasonry, may be summed up in these words. To efface from among men the prejudices of caste, the conventional distinctions of color, origin, opinion, nationality. To annihilate fanaticism and superstition, extirpate national discord, and with it extinguish the firebrand of war. In a word, to arrive by free and pacific progress at one formula or model of eternal and universal right, according to which each individual human being shall be free to develop every faculty with which he may be endowed, and to concur heartily and with all fullness of his strength in the bestowment of happiness upon all, and thus to make of the whole human race one family of brotherhood, united by affection, wisdom, and labor. Rebold's History of Masonry Page 62. The above quotations from two of the most prominent modern writers on Freemasonry, the one dealing with the philosophical and the other with the historical aspect on the subject, may fairly represent the genius or the ideals and aims of Masonry. How far short of this ideal Masonry may fall today, it is no part of the object of this book to show. No one, however, at all familiar with the subject will for a moment undertake to maintain that nothing is left to be accomplished. It is, indeed, something grand and sublime to have conceived such an ideal, and to have striven in any measure towards its realization. And this, Masonry has done from its earliest history. There is a thread of tradition connecting modern Masonry with the most ancient mysteries of antiquity. The ancient landmarks may be discovered in every nation and time. Notwithstanding the connection that is so evidently existes, says Dr. Rebold, between the ancient mysteries and the Freemasonry of our day, the latter should be considered an imitation rather than a continuation of those ancient mysteries. For initiation into them was the entering of a school, wherein were taught art, science, morals, law, philanthropy, and the wonders and worship of nature. Rebold's History, page 62. The universal science and the sublime philosophy, once taught in the greater mysteries of Egypt, Chaldea, Persia, and India, and among many other nations of antiquity, is a dead letter in modern Freemasonry. The intelligent Mason, however, should be the last person in the world to deny that such wisdom once existed, for the simple reason that the whole superstructure of Masonry is built upon the traditions of its existence and its ritual serves as its living monument. Proficiency in the preceding degree is everywhere made a reason for advancement in masonry. This proficiency is made to consist in the ability of the candidate to repeat word for word certain rituals and obligations already passed. The meaning or explanations of which constitute the lectures in various degrees, the usage at this point, in the United States at least, serves rather to secure the rights and benefits of the Lodge to those entitled to them, and to withhold them from all others, than to advance the candidate in real knowledge. In other Masonic jurisdictions, however, a different custom prevails. Of the Belgium Lodges, for example, a brother writes as follows, Our Lodge, called La Charité, at Orient Charlevoix, is under obedience of the Great Orient at Brussels, and has the Scottish right. No Mason is supposed to know anything of the ritual by heart. Questions and answers are read out, especially at initiation. The work of the Mason is supposed to be interior work in himself, but it cannot become external labor. So in order to obtain his degrees, he has to do some work of his own. 
and no one is supposed to learn anything by heart except words, signs, and passwords. Now I have to tell you that every Mason is supposed to do some literal work on general subjects concerning the welfare of man, human institutions, sociology, history, philosophy, philanthropy, etc., etc. And it is such work that a young Mason is supposed to do. Then, after reading these papers, they are discussed by all members of the Lodge present, perhaps for three or four meetings, until the subject seems to be exhausted. This develops, in the young Mason, his intelligence and his moral feeling. As will be shown in a later section, this method conforms to that pursued in the lesser mysteries of antiquity, which were preparatory for the greater mysteries. It should be borne in mind that in modern masonry, in the ancient mysteries, and in all of the great religions, there was always an exoteric portion given out to the world, to the uninitiated, and an esoteric portion reserved for the initiate, and revealed by degrees, according as the candidate demonstrated his fitness to receive, conceal, and rightly use the knowledge so imparted. Few professed Christians are, perhaps aware, that such was the case with Christianity during the first two or three centuries. The following quotations from Albert Pike's great work may therefore be of interest. On page 541 he says, This, in its purity, as taught by Christ himself, was the true primitive religion as communicated by God to the patriarchs. It was no new religion, but the reproduction of the oldest of all, and its true and perfect morality is the morality of masonry, as it is the morality of every creed of antiquity. St. Augustine says, What is now called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and was not absent from the human race until Christ came from which time the true religion, which existed already, began to be called Christian. St. Augustine was Bishop of Hippo, born in 347 AD, and lived near enough the time of Christ to know whereof he wrote. But to continue our quotations from Morals and Dogma. In the early days of Christianity, there was an initiation like those of the pagans, Persons were admitted on special conditions only. To arrive at complete knowledge of the doctrine, they had to pass three degrees of instruction. The initiates were consequently divided into three classes. The first, auditors. The second, catechumens. And the third, the faithful. These doctrines and the celebration of the holy sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, were kept with profound secrecy. These mysteries were divided into three parts. The first styled the Mass of the Catechumens. The second, the Mass of the Faithful. The celebration of the mysteries of Mithras was also styled a Mass. And the ceremonies used were the same. There were found in all the sacraments of the Catholic Church, even the breath of confirmation. The Basiliadines, a sect of Christians that arose soon after the time of the Apostles, practiced the mysteries with the old Egyptian legend. They symbolized Osiris by the sun, Isis by the moon, and Typhon by Scorpio, and wore crystals bearing these emblems as amulets or talismans to protect them from danger, upon which were also a brilliant star and the serpent. They were copied from the talismans of Persia and Arabia and given to every candidate at his initiation. They claimed to possess a secret doctrine coming to them directly from Jesus Christ, different from that of the Gospels and Epistles, and superior to those communications, which, in their eyes, were merely exoteric. This secret doctrine they did not communicate to everyone, and among them, the extensive sects of the Basilidines, hardly one in a thousand knew it. As we learn from Irenaeus, we know the name of only the highest class of their initiates. They were styled elect, or elus, and strangers to the world. They had at least three degrees, the material, the intellectual, and the spiritual, and the lesser and greater mysteries, and the number of those who attained the higher degrees were quite small. In the hierarchia attributed to St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, the first bishop of Athens, 
the tradition of the sacrament is said to have been divided into three degrees or grades, purification, initiation, and accomplishment or perfection. And it mentions also, as a part of the ceremony, the bringing to sight, the apostolic constitutions. Attributed to Clemens, Bishop of Rome, describes the early church and says, These regulations must on no account be communicated to all sorts of persons because of the mysteries contained in them. It is interesting to contrast the utterances of early bishops of the Christian Church with the bulls and anathemas of excommunication of later popes. Hurled against the Masons for entering the same doctrines and practicing the same rites, but this was after the ideal of domination had seized the modern church, which tolerates no rival, and would destroy all opposition. Papal supremacy must be maintained at all cost. Tertullian, who died about AD 216, says in his Apology, None are admitted to the religious mysteries without an oath of secrecy. We appeal to your Thracian and Eleusinian mysteries, and we are specifically bound to this caution. Because if we prove faithless, we should not only provoke heaven, but draw upon our heads the utmost rigor of human displeasure. Clemens, Bishop of Alexandria, born A.D. 191, says in his Stromata that he cannot explain the mysteries because he should thereby, according to the old proverb, put a sword into the hands of a child. He frequently compares the discipline of the secret with the heathen mysteries as to their internal and recondite wisdom. Origen, born A.D. 134 or 135, answering Kelusus, who had objected that the Christians had a concealed doctrine, said, Inasmuch as the essential and important doctrines and principles of Christianity are openly taught, it is foolish to object that there are other things that are recondite, for this is common discipline, with that of those philosophers in whose teachings some things were exoteric and some esoteric. And it is enough to say that it was so with some of the disciples of Pythagoras. The formula which the primitive church pronounced at the moment of celebrating its mysteries was this, Depart ye profane. Let the catechumens and those who have not been admitted or initiated go forth. Archelaus, Bishop of Cascara in Mesopotamia, who, in the year 278, conducted a controversy with the Manichaeans, said, These mysteries the Church now communicates to him who has passed through the introductory degree. These are not explained to the Gentiles at all nor are they taught in the hearing of catechumens, but much that is spoken is in disguised terms, that the faithful who possess the knowledge may be still more informed, and those who are not acquainted with it may suffer no disadvantage. Cyril, Bishop of Jerusalem, was born in the year 316 and died in 386. In his catechesis, he says, The Lord spake in parables to his hearers in general, but to his disciples he explained in private the parables and allegories, which he spoke in public. Just so the church discovers its mysteries to those who have advanced beyond the class of catechumens, we employ obscure terms with others. St. Basil, the great bishop of Caesarea, born in the year 326 and dying in the year 376, says, we receive the dogmas transmitted to us by writing, and those which have descended to us from the apostles. Beneath the mystery of oral tradition, for several things have been handed to us without writing, lest the vulgar, too familiar with our dogmas, should lose a due respect for them. This is what the uninitiated are not permitted to contemplate, and how should it ever be proper to write and circulate among the people an account of them? St. Gregory Nanzianzen Bishop of Constantinople, A.D. 379, says, You have heard as much of the mysteries as we were allowed to speak, openly in the ears of all. The rest will be communicated to you in private, and that you must retain within yourself. Our mysteries are not to be made known to strangers. The foregoing quotations are from Pike's Morals and Dogma, page 141, 142, 143, 144 and 145.
To this list of witnesses are also added St. Ambrose, Archbishop of Milan, A.D. 340, St. Christostom of Constantinople, 354 to 417, Cyril of Alexandria, Bishop in 412, Theodort, Bishop of Seropolis in Syria in 420, and others to the same effect. It is beyond controversy that there was an exoteric and an esoteric doctrine with the early Christians, that the esoteric doctrines were communicated orally in the mysteries of initiation, and that these mysteries conformed to and were originally derived from those of the so-called pagan world. The mystery of Christ revealed a new interpretation after the first Nicaea Council, and as the church sought domination, it lost the great secret and since then has denied that it ever existed, and done all in its power to obliterate all its records and monuments. While we are concerned with masonry rather than Christianity, it is needless necessary to show the connecting links, in order that the ancient landmarks may not only be discerned, but correctly interpreted. Neither Christianity nor Freemasonry is the direct and linear descendant of the greater mysteries of antiquity and both have failed to preserve the key of interpretation, and are generally unaware that such a key ever existed. My contention is not against either masonry or Christianity, but for the rejuvenation of both, through the restoration of the secret doctrine to each. Modern masonry never possessed the key, while many of the early Christian sects had it in their possession, but in time lost it through worldliness the greed of earthly domination, and the decay of spirituality. Something further may be shown as to the origin of the Christian mysteries. In the year 525 BC, Cambyses, called the Mad, led an army into Egypt, overrun the country, destroyed its cities, palaces, and temples, scattered its priest initiates, and reduced the country to a Persian province. Many of its priests took refuge in Greece, and conveyed thither the Egyptian mysteries which Pythagoras had journeyed to Egypt to attain half a century earlier. In the time of Plato, a century later, the mysteries were in a flourishing condition, and in them he learned his sublime philosophy. At the beginning of our era, the mysteries had declined. There remained, however, the Gnostics, the Essenes, and the Therapeutae of Alexandria, and from these the Christian mysteries were undoubtedly derived. The Neoplatonists, headed by Ammonius Saccus, undertook to preserve the primitive revelation, and the utterances of the Christian bishops to which I have referred show how the secret doctrine was adopted from the earlier mysteries by the primitive Christians during the first three centuries of our era, after the First Council of Nice, A.D. 325. Little more was heard of the earlier doctrines and with the burning of the Great Library of Alexandria, Catholic supremacy and the Dark Ages obliterated the primitive wisdom in Western Europe, as it was also overrun by hordes of barbarians from the north. The principal seats of learning were the convents, coming now to the dawn of the 16th century and the Great Protestant Reformation. We find Johann Trivimus, Abbot of St. Jacob at Wartsburg, celebrated as one of the greatest of alchemists and adepts, and Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus were his pupils. John Roycling, a famous Kabbalist of his time and counted as one of the most learned men in his day in Europe, was the friend and preceptor of Luther, and Luther's first public utterances were a course of lectures on the philosophy of Aristotle. A strong effort was made to revive the ancient wisdom, but the age was too gross and superstitious, and the Reformation resulted in centuries of blind belief and the suppression of the secret doctrine. Modern masonry honors as its great ancient teachers, Zoroaster, Pythagoras, Plato, and many others, and in some of its degrees gives a brief summary of their doctrines. Masonry, in a certain sense, includes them all and has adopted their precepts. They were all initiates in the mysteries and fundamentally their doctrines were the same. All taught the existence of the great architect of the universe, the immortality of the soul, and the unqualified brotherhood of man. And with these primitive and fundamental truths, masonry is in full accord. 
the guilds of masons or builders with which modern Freemasonry claims connection. Doubtless suggested the name of Mason, the symbolism of the builder, and perhaps the form of organization or advancement by degrees as apprentice, fellow craft, and master, representing the three degrees of the ancient mysteries. The past two or three centuries, at most, will include the whole of the history of modern Freemasonry. The organization is recent, but its principles, when clearly defined and intelligently interpreted, are eternal and are in full accord with the greater mysteries of antiquity. The foregoing running comment on some of the ancient landmarks will enable us to draw comparisons and derive interpretations of Masonic symbols and glyphics from ancient mysteries, and so to discover the science and philosophy that constitute the genius of Masonry instead of being an imitation of the mysteries of antiquity. Masonry should become the restoration and perpetuation through the coming centuries, not by relaxing its discipline or changing its ritual, but by deepening the learning, intensifying the zeal, and elevating the aim of every brother throughout the world. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.